got somebody who thinks he's tough as a nickel steak. But they all come to speed for the do re me. Now get this. We partners, we brothers, and we friends. My little brother was 15 years old. Think about that. You're waiting for no. How about cutting hands? Oh, I get it. You want some kind of contest, huh? You're real smart boys. I guess maybe you'll have to kill me. Will hurt if I do. Well, it looks like I finally ran into someone that likes to play as rough as I do. Yeah, this must be a lucky night. And my body, they're not nice like me. Are we supposed to say thanks? You're not supposed to say nothing, soldier. will show you as much about survival as deliverance, as much about human courage as Midnight Express, as much about armed conflict as Apocalypse Now. The bayous of Louisiana, the home of a little understood group of Americans. They're a peaceful people as long as they're left alone. The National Guard on weekend maneuvers. In 48 hours, they'll be home with their families. There's only one problem. We live back in here. This is our home. They've crossed the boundary into a territory where they don't belong. We ran into some people that are real weird, and I think maybe they're trying to kill us. They violated laws that never knew existed. Somebody figure out where the hell we're going and do it quick. Gotta go east to go north. Tell that damn thing. And the farther they go, the closer they get to nowhere. Uh, I'm gonna do it. But I'm gonna fight my way out of here. Southern Comfort. It's the land of hospitality, unless you don't belong there. Hello, folks. This is the last call of Torchies. You're uh, quintessential, because I haven't seen another one. Uh, Walter Hill retrospective podcast, and I hate that fucking word so much, so I'm not going to use it anymore. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Gary Hill, and um, with me as usual is Cameron Scott. How you doing, sir? I'm doing fabulous. Ready to get down with some Cajuns, but not really. Not really, no. I'd be, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'd be a foolhardy um, ass. Uh, I can't. I can't use words today, apparently. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it'd be bad, bro, because we don't know the terrain or whatnot. But um. With me um, from north of the border, uh, my dear friend from the They Must Be Destroyed on Site podcast, Mister Lee Russell. How you doing, sir? Uh, I don't live in a swamp, so I I'm sort of counting my blessings there. Uh, it's 2022, could be worse. So there we go. There you go. And uh, yeah, this 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 is a a pretty cool occasion because. Long, long, long ago, uh, this person and I collaborated probably for the first or, or possibly second time. My memory's not so good, but we did these Walter Hill Four films as a one-year anniversary for Cinema Beef, and she was on this particular show where we did this and the Long Riders together. Uh, J.B. Sammons, how you doing, girl? I'm doing very well, thank you, and thank you for having me. You're you're very welcome, and that makes you feel like like podcasting old right now. That I said this happened eight years ago, but the show's been going on longer than eight years, so it's it's closer to nine now. And I mentioned towards that tenth year of cinema beef, and I'm like, okay, what 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 have I accomplished? And you know, I don't think like that though. So, <laughs> but um, 
always welcome, Jamie. Always welcome. You know, just just in case the folks have been living under a rock, uh, tell the folks the shows you're involved in, and ha and have been involved in. Oh well, have been. That's <laughs> that's um that's a lot. Um, now I do really all I do now is horror in the House of Salmons, where I uh, Brian and I do we kind of took a couple of shows we used to do and smashed them together. So we used to do the ABs of AB, the ABs, the ABCs of <laughs> hidden horror. And we were going alphabetically and we're just picking movies that we want to talk about that we either feel are not seen enough or that maybe we've just always wanted to talk about them and have never had an opportunity elsewhere. And so we did that, and then we also did – I was just doing this fun little experiment um, that we came to call uh, Attack of the Colossal Collection because one year I just decided on – I was like, hey, starting in January, let's start with at the beginning and watch every single movie in our collection in order. Mm. And Brian has – Still not forgiven me for that because <laughs> we have a lot of those like cheap ass 50 packs and oh, yeah. they have a lot of monkey detective movies in them. And <laughs> he hates those you know, from like the 30s when gorillas were big and everywhere. So that's kind of funny. And I'm like, look, we're going to find movies that we never would have seen otherwise, because, you know, when you have stuff like that, you you make you keep it for one or two movies, maybe. And then. There are things on there you'll never see otherwise. And also, I have movies that he would never watch. He has movies that I might never have watched. So this way, we're, you know, going through the entire thing. It's fun, I think. But um, <laughs> but anyway, so we took those and smashed them together, and that became Horror in the House of Salmons. So that's what we do. It, get re it gets released twice a month. And... Um, that's about it. As a matter of fact, uh, our end of the year show, the top 10 movies of 2021 should be coming out this weekend. And then, or like, okay, it's Sunday. So tonight. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's about it. That's pretty much all I do these days. I've really scaled it back. I don't, I don't do much podcasting anymore compared to what I used to do. Um, so... And you're okay. you're you're on the network with uh with Bo as well and the the what you watching uh, show right? Oh, that's right. Oh shit, sorry, Bo. Um, yeah. <laughs> you you ain't gotta apologize to Bo, you know. <laughs> I do that one, but it's only once a month, and that's why I just don't. It's once a month, and it's an hour long, so it's not even. I don't have to do any prep work for it. I don't have to produce it like I do everything else that I. I don't. I I have I. It's like talking on the phone with Bo for an hour, and that's – I just forget it. I forget that I, it's an actual show because all mm -hmm. we do is just talk, and it's fun, though. We talk about things that we've watched recently, and then sometimes it veers off into crazy stories about boxes of frozen puppies on people's porches. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Deliverance. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> but – and uh, so, yeah, so – that's really it. <laughs> well, we we give Papa Bo his tribute at least twice a month on this show, and uh, for 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 the Patreon listeners to enjoy something else. And you know? <laughs> yeah, Bo and I go we go way back. He was the first person I ever podcasted with. Yeah, it was like 150 years. Ago. 100, 151 years ago, maybe I don't know. Because you got to be exact or something. I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm fucking with you. <laughs> But, you know. it, was, it was counting after about 120 anyway, right? Yeah, I mean, does it matter? Doesn't matter. <laughs> cool. Uh, what we're here for, uh, and what I'm sure is a cold Canadian and a cold um, Michigan uh, afternoon, I'm sure as well. Um, Not here. No, actually, it's actually fucking warm uh, today, kind of. <laughs> go put some shorts on, man. Go go play outside. That. Uh... <laughs> Um, to discuss the film Southern Comfort from 1981, which is uh, next in line in the the Walter Hill pantheon as we we, we roll on. Um, 
Yeah, in case you guys didn't know, here's the Cheapo Plot Synopsis. Uh, during a routine exercise, a team of National Guards... National Guards, that's terrible. ...are threatened by, <laughs> by angry and violent locals. Uh, this is directed by Walter Hill. Um, written by M Michael Caine, not that Michael Caine. Uh, Walter Hill... Uh, being reteamed with his um, alien producing writing partner David Geiler, and um, mm. this, this stars some people that you, that you may know. <clears throat> I just talked about this guy Keith Carradine uh, from from uh, <laughs> the last film that we did as as Spencer uh, Powers Booth making his debut in the Walter Pantheon, and what a debut it is is Harden, uh, Fred Ward as Reese, uh, Franklin Seals as Sims, T K Carter as Cribs. Louis Smith as Stucky, Les Cannon as Casper, Peter Coyote as Poole, oh, poor Poole, mm -hmm. uh, Alan Autry as Bowden, uh, who I know and I'm sure Jamie does too from the In the Heat of the Night television show from back in the day. That's right. Um, Actually, I had a neighbor whose little sister used to sing the theme song, only she had a crush on Bubba, Alan Autry. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And she would sing, in the heat of the night, Bubba's on my mind, was how she, she changed the words, and I'm not going to sing it, but she changed the words, and she would just walk around the house singing that. And I'm, All right. She was like seven. No, that, that, man, that's fucking adorable, I got to say, you know. Yeah, it was. It's kind of like little girls are in love with their daddies. She's in love with Alan Autry, seven years old, you know. Um... A bearded, a rare bearded Brian James as 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 Trapper, uh, in name only there. Uh, Sonny Landham shows up again as another one of the hunters, and there's um, yeah, we're gonna get into this mother now. Um, me and Jamie discussed this film a long time ago. Like I said, eight, eight years ago, it's a long way away. Um, I'm gonna kick it to our guest first and ask her um her thoughts on Southern Comfort once again. Les le bon temps roulé. <laughs> I love this film. This was one that my mother introduced me to when I was very young. I was probably, uh, I was under 10. I don't know. It was when it was running on cable after it had had its release. And I just have always loved it. I love the brutality. And I think it teaches a very good lesson. You know, if you were a stranger in a strange land, you know, be nice. Like, I don't know. I don't, I don't understand why they're surprised at the reaction they got when Stucky fires off into the woods. Now, he's firing blanks, but these people don't know that. All they see is some guy shooting at him, and apparently he's a really bad shot. <laughs> and then, like, that's what they're guessing. So I really, it surprises me that they are surprised. Like, what did you think was going to happen? You know, that was a, that was a shitty thing to do. So you got Peter Coyote killed. And then apparently they only paid him, I'm guessing for a very small amount, because later on, when you see his body, you don't get to see his face. They actually, <laughs> and I'm like, they must not have gotten Peter Coyote back. <laughs> That's just some <laughs> random dude with his head turned. But you know, I just, uh, this is one that's always been close to me. I, I don't know. I can't even tell you how many times I've seen it. I just, and the cast, holy crap. It always makes me think of Predator. Just mm -hmm. because you have a bunch of, like, militaristic guys out in the middle of, well, in this case, it's a swamp. But basically out in the middle of nowhere, because they don't know where they are. Try, um, you know, fighting not only the elements, but an outside force. And I think, well, plus, incidentally, uh, Sunday Landham is in both. But mm. I think he would have been, it would have been funny if he played the, oh, what's his name? The, um, the Alan Autry character. So he would get to paint himself up in both movies. <laughs> I just think that would have been great. But this cast is incredible. It, it's just, um, it's like a who's who of 
guys, you know, that were around at the time. And that's another thing I like about it. Another thing that also reminds me of Predator is this until we get to the end, until we get to the town, it's nothing but guys. Yeah. And I actually really like movies like that in the thing, um, because you get to to get a glimpse into the brotherhood and the camaraderie that goes on um, when men are in close situations or know each other. You know, I don't know. I really like that. I, I like seeing that. And so movies like this, uh, I'm just kind of drawn to. But yeah, um, I think if people out there like either of the movies that I mentioned, then chances are you'll probably like this one too. I mean, it doesn't have aliens, but uh, whereas the other two do, this one uh, has you know a more homegrown foe. But um, that, you know they just kind of they keep stepping in it too. They're just rake stepping all the way through this <laughs> movie, just fucking themselves over. And uh, it's you know it's interesting to watch. It's it's tense. It's exciting. And yeah, like I said, teaches a very good lesson. Don't piss off the locals and you'll be fine. Cool. Cameron. Uh, I don't know what to say after that glowing uh, summarization that Jamie just gave. <laughs> but I, uh, I kind of feel that she hit the nail on the head. It's, it's, it's predator with a more realistic threat. And I thought you were, I thought that meant you didn't like it. When you're like, I don't know what to say after that glowing thing. And I was like, oh, shit. Oh, no. Like <laughs> no, no, God, I love this movie. I remember watching this. Uh, my grandfather had introduced me to this movie. It was on cable. My grandfather introduced me to, to a lot of movies like this. But this is the movie that, you know, I first remember seeing Powers Booth in. I mean, he is such a presence, and everybody is a presence in this movie. You know, Powers Booth, Fred Ward, Carradine, Coyote, Brian James especially. Brian James is so good <laughs> when it does that turnaround at the end, like when all of a sudden, yeah, this motherfucker does know how to speak English like there was ever a doubt. <laughs> but this is like stepping from, you know, frying pan to fire. You know, they make so many mistakes in this movie for being a bunch of, you know, the, the elite, you know, Bravo team uh National Guardsman, you know, big mistake getting lost in the bayou with no ammo. Second mistake, stealing a Cajun's canoes. Third mistake, firing blanks. Fourth mistake, you know, <laughs> just taking a hostage. Fifth mistake, destroying the cabin. It is, it just is a domino effect. It just shows you what can happen when you make the wrong decisions. It's a, a just so clear cut of a case of, you know, fuck around and find out. And you know, it just shows you the the camaraderie between these guys and how it breaks down when they're they're under fire, you know, and they're under attack. It shows how everybody has their own way of dealing with it, and it's it's like J Jamie said, though, you know, it's a it's a it's a good conglomeration of just these manly characters just fighting off the odds, kind kind of like you said, like the thing. It's it's great. And everybody in this movie is somebody, you know, Sandy, Sonny Landham, you know, Alan Graff, everybody is just so great. And got to mention that Ry Cooter soundtrack, that Ry Cooter mm -hmm. soundtrack just is, is so good. Everything about this movie is this chef's kiss. All right, Lee. Uh, yeah, um, pretty much in agreement here. It, it is a great fucking movie um although I, I i'll go on the thread of these guys making mistakes i mean the difference between these guys and what you would like later see in predator or something along those lines where you know they are an elite fucking fighting force of like mercenaries and stuff most of the guys in this team are just fucking weekend warriors right like they're just <laughs> national guards guys who you know, they'll do some training. They'll be called out to do a couple of weeks of work here and there. But for the most part, they're not really professional soldiers. Uh, Peter Coyote is the only actual real professional soldier who's had, who's had seen action. Uh, it's established. He had like a, a bronze star or something like that in Vietnam. Um, and the rest of these guys are basically larpers for the most part like especially <laughs> especially casper who tries to take control of the unit after peter coyote is killed um he is basically <laughs> he's got 
on paper the credentials, but he's got no real cred with uh, with any of these guys under him. Um, and so everybody is kind of uh, fighting for dominance here. Everyone's got a different idea of what they're supposed to do once the shit hits the fan. Um, you can see that, like, uh, Keith Carradine's character, he's kind of like, I'll go with the flow, easygoing, not going to try to get in conflict with anybody. And Powers Booth is like this loner who is actually capable and he just doesn't want any of this shit. He just wants to get the fuck out of there. So those two are kind of like they come together because they see the rest of the people in this group are all pretty much fuck ups that are going to get them killed. So they're like, well, kind of stick together and see if we can get out of this and let these idiots fucking do whatever the fuck they're going to fucking do. Um, but yeah, it's, it's an interesting dynamic because you get all these different people. Like you got Fred Ward's character who is just basically a psychopath. Like he, he's, he's looking to kill somebody. Like he's the guy who actually brings live ammo with them. Um, so, you know, he's looking to shoot somebody like he's looking for an excuse to shoot somebody. And then you have uh, the guy who plays coach um, who is like deeply fucked up <laughs> and <laughs> <He's> uh, disturbed. <laughs> he is. And it's, it's, it's kind of funny, you know, like Walter Hill swears up and down that this is not, in any way, shape or form, anything to do with Vietnam. And like, I call bullshit on that. Like that's, that's, that's the same as like freaking saying, you know, that the exorcist isn't a horror movie, you know, it's the same kind of bullshit there. Um, this is totally a fucking, uh, parallel to, uh, fucking Vietnam. I mean, you have the coach character at one point, uh, this white soldier rip open his shirt, paint a Christian symbol on his chest and then burn an indigenous person out of his home like that. If, if that isn't directly making parallels to uh, some of the war crimes that happened in Vietnam, then I don't know what is. But um, this is actually it's, it's a fantastic film. It's uh, tense from start to finish, although the 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 end of it is even more tense. Like it, it's it's one of the best like 15 minute sort of sequences of just like tension building that I've ever seen in the film uh it's immaculate the way they do it um like they just they're not sure are, are we have we just walked into a trap or are these people in this town totally oblivious to what's going on uh are they these people who just came in on the canoe are they the ones that were hunting us because we never really got a good look at them mm -hmm. and uh it's it is just really well done and <laughs> the funny thing is it's kind of Walter Hill doing something he's done a lot and would go on to do even more. Like, uh, this is kind of the Warriors in a way. Like, it, it's kind of the same idea. You got a band of people. Oh, and I have... always think that. I always think that. Yeah. It's these, they're trying to get home. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's Warriors in the Bayou. Yeah. And then, I mean, he'd go on later to write on Aliens. And Aliens does a lot of the same stuff, too. Especially when you take into uh, account the sort of idea of the capable leader is like the first guy to die. So it mm -hmm. leaves everybody else struggling for leadership of the group and having all these internal struggles. It seems to be a, a common theme that Walter Hill likes to keep coming back to. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, no, I was, uh, I was, I was going to put a, put a, a period on that. So someone else could talk. I, no, that's okay. Leave it, hang in there. Um, yeah, it's 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 um it's a great film, and I I, I love the the fact that and I, I'm I'm gonna make comparison to this to um like it, the way they filmed Texas Chainsaw Massacre to where it was like 150 degrees outside, so you seen like the desperation and the grimace on their face that they they filmed this in the actual Louisiana swamps, so they were walking around and just the conditions that they described before they they left out to go into these swamps, you know that. that you know the water's gonna be freezing cold, so and, and you know you're, terrain you don't know and all that all that stuff. The whole speech and they they were actually walking through this throughout the film. So at certain parts of the film, you could see them like like certain mannerisms where he's actually cold, like like shivering, like really hard, like like he just got like like, like, like cold. That water's a little too cold. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just saying it looks cold. It look, it look, it, yeah. The, 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 I feel the cold when the, I'm watching this film. The conditions, yeah, for sure. And um, 
that, that's why I compare it to like seeing like Texas Chainsaw Massacre and in that sense because they were literally walking through all this stuff and um, <clears throat> I love the fact that there's like at least three wild cards in this movie. I mean, Powers Booth is the new guy, so you think he's going to be the wild card, and then Alan Autry, uh, C- Couch, uh, he he became like the wild card, and eventually a lot of these guys became the wild card because they started losing their faculties. The, the more and more bad stuff happened to them, and and yeah, that, that that's um that that idea is wild. The the, the breakdown and. Uh, like like Lee said, it, 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 to say that it doesn't have anything to do with war, it's maybe Vietnam War, you could tell some of these guys have some PTSD going on because th- there's some are actually there and it, 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 it's, uh, that, that that's, um well, not the actors, but the, the characters themselves and the, oh gosh, <laughs> Brian James with the beard I, 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 and, and, the, and the accent, which he actually took the time to go hang out with the locals to learn the accent. So, yeah, so I thought he's great. It's, it's not like Tango and Cash where he just does the, the, the Cockney accent. Oh, he, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's him. That's the, the governor. Thing that, I, that stuck out to me about him was his arm. Yeah. <laughs> like, his arm was clearly there, mm. um, which I thought was interesting. But he did, an, he did such a good job. When I was a kid... I thought he was real. Like, I thought they had just pulled some guy from the bayou yeah. <laughs> to, oh, totally. to play this role. That's how realistic it seemed. So, he did a really good job. Mm. I just want to mention also, like, just, just going further into, like, the uh, the kind of intergroup thing going on. It, it, I find it interesting, too, that... So, Peter Coyote is obviously a professional, and, and he's trying to get these these fucking idiots into shape basically like he you can tell he doesn't have a lot of respect for anybody in this group for the most part because they're all kind of fuck ups um but when they make that fateful decision to steal the boats it's Peter Coyote who okays it right so he kind of falls for the peer pressure of the rest of the group who are you know kind of joking around like yeah let's just take the boats you know we'll just leave them a note or whatever or whatever the fuck you know kind of thing and it's that decision that sets them all down a bad path. If they just hadn't taken those boats and then, you know, followed up with shooting those blanks at them from, from uh. The, uh, the river and they just, they, they keep fucking up. They keep doing more shitty things. They, they blow Brian James out of his fucking house and take him prisoner. And it's just more and more transgressions and uh, just a clear, again, hate to harp on it, but parallel to what soldiers were doing in Vietnam or whatever other country you want to fit into that slot as far as, like, an imperialist power going in and fighting a war and, a lo- and you know, alongside the indigenous people of that country and, and, you know, burning them out of their houses and shit like that. Like, very... it's it's. I mean, it, I, I, I love Walter Hill and everything, but it's like, dude... <laughs> It's so on the nose that this is a Vietnam film in a lot of oh, ways. Oh, totally. Yeah, and uh, you're just being stubborn for whatever reason. I don't know why, but, you know. Just admit it. I mean, yeah. what would be so bad about admitting it? You know, if there's <laughs> nothing, it wouldn't be a bad thing. But here's a question. Now, I did notice that it specifically says this is 1973. Um, which, is there, what's the reasoning for that? Did I... Um, because I, I never heard anyone. I mean, I never saw anything that that made me go, "Oh, that's why it's 1973." Other I, than if he wanted it to uh, reflect the war. Uh, that, and I think it's also making a kind of um, statement about what, like, this sort of weakened warrior culture, like this mercenary culture, like Soldier of Fortune magazine and stuff like that, sort of came out around this era. And this whole idea of you could go off and fight a war for some warlord in some country somewhere and make tons of money, be a professional soldier, you know, you could live out your dream of being a soldier if you're one of those people, you know. A lot of these, like, uh, National Guards people, they're, they're, there's a good segment of them who no doubt joined up for that sort of thrill to, you know, be closer to that sort of thing. 
and like you've got a couple guys actually in the in the squad here who obviously kind of trigger happy and looking to you know shoot somebody who's a different color than them you know um but yeah i I think it's just that it was kind of you know to use the word zeitgeist it was kind of in the zeitgeist to you know you got the vietnam war is kind of winding down uh America, even if they don't want to openly admit it, they've lost the war. Uh, there's a there's probably a lot of uh, sort of internal national uh, grief with that. You know, uh, people with uh, trigger fingers wanting to go out and shoot somebody as some sort of weird nationalistic revenge. Uh, and also, it's just a time of conflict where there is a lot of these, like you know, especially in Africa, a lot of like. Uh, uh, let's overthrow this communist government in this little country in Africa no one's ever heard of and make tons of money doing it, you know? Um, a lot of that stuff was going around. Okay. I mean, so uh, there. W- um, I guess that, that does answer my question because I just wanted to see if there was anything I missed that, um, you know, that made him, that that was, because it, so, it was so specific, you know, mm. like, specifically 1973. So I just wanted to, make sure I hadn't missed anything. But I mean, what I kind of got from it was that it was just a general, um, a, a general setting. And so yeah. I think that, I think that makes sense. Okay. Um, you had mentioned earlier about Casper trying to take control after, uh, uh, you know, cause he's the only one that has the qualifications, like you said on paper, which yeah. is an excellent way to put it. I think it's interesting how he keeps trying to, he's basically uh, regurgitating everything he's read from yeah. the manuals that they're supposed to follow and the training that they've had. And he's just, uh, he's, he's grasping onto that because mm-hmm. he doesn't have the instinct to actually follow and make decisions based on what his gut tells him to do. So he's just regurgitating these things. And at one point, you know, they call him out and he's like, look, you know, you repeating the manual to us is not going to help us at all. And (laughs) that's true. You know, and then there's that one grenade that he makes and he's like real (laughs) proud of it. (laughs) He's like, you know, and it does nothing. (laughs) Remember your training, you know, and I'm like, okay, so he pulled from the back of his brain somewhere, some training about making a single grenade that he then used for no reason at all. Like it, it did nothing. Yeah. And it was basically as impotent as he is in mm-hmm. this situation. Impotent's a good word for Casper. I think, good... I think so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, cause let's face it. Casper is one of those guys who is, he fancies himself on being book smart, but he's not, uh, I'm using air quotes here, but you can't see him. Uh, he's not street smart. You know, yeah. he has he has no experience. He's just like, yeah, I'm just going by the book. And he's, and he's yeah, and, he, and he's not, um, he's not one of these guys who's like worked him, worked his way up like in the army or anything like that either. Like you get the sense that um, he'd be the kind of guy who would go to, like officer school or something like that, instead of like, you know, starting out in, in as a private somewhere kind of thing. Yeah. He's very, uh, book oriented, I guess. Mm. Uh, and th- yeah, it, you, when you're going to be, especially in a leadership position in a situation like that, you have to be able to rely on your gut. You have to be to be able to rely on your experience. That's the whole point of working your way up the ranks. You know, that's mm-hmm. <laughs> that's why yeah. you wouldn't have like a private come in who just joined to come in and make these decisions because they don't have the experience and they don't have the know-how. And it also takes a, you know, you have to be able to remain calm and make decisions with your head. Like there's a whole lot of stuff that goes in to uh, being in a leadership position in a situation like this. And I don't think he really has any of that. Plus he also doesn't have the respect of the men. Right. And you can't do shit if you're, if the people under you don't respect you. Like, yeah. It's just, um, and so the whole thing just ends up being a, a comedy of errors. And uh, yeah. And then at the end, when you had talked about how they, they get to, you know, they go frying pan fire. Mm. The, uh, the beauty of that ending is that we don't know 
as the audience are should we be should we be listening to Powers Booth or should be we be listening to Carradine? Yeah. And um, by the way, Keith is my favorite Carradine. <laughs> that means nothing. I just like to throw that out there. He's my he's my he and Robert kind of tie for my favorites. But um, but you don't know just as much as they don't know, because, you know, he sees, you know, at one point he kind of walks off in one direction. Sonny Landon comes walking out of the woods and just standing there. Well, he doesn't actually do anything even though he has a gun so Mm -hmm. when that could just be paranoia you know we we don't see him threaten him at that point so maybe he's just being paranoid you know um Mm -hmm. then there's the scene with you know he sees them hoisting the um pigs the the, yeah um the nooses he sees Mm -hmm. them throwing the nooses over and he's like oh like two nooses two of us no you know but then we then see that you know they're draining the pigs with and and, (laughs) but you're kind of going back and forth you're like oh shit oh no oh shit oh maybe i mean it's brilliant Mm -hmm. brilliant and then when it finally comes to a head and you see what act you know everything is kind of brought into the open and then it's like shit (laughs) (laughs) yeah You know what I think their biggest mistake was in that scene was when they got there. They they obviously met with food and southern hospitality because they said, "We've been walking through these these swamps for all this time. We're cold. Uh, can we get a change of clothes if we got it?" You know? Because yeah. well, you know what? That's true. Because then then the guys wouldn't have picked him out so easily as soldiers. Yeah. The the guys they were after. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're just walking around. They're war fatigue still. They, 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 they stick out like a sore thumb amongst, amongst those people. And, um, and plus, they probably could have smelt them in that town. Yeah. Oh, that. Uh, everybody in that town smelled. <laughs> I mean, let's yeah. face it. There wasn't a lot of deodorant going around there. <laughs> they're, they're, um, they're all swampers. They were lucky to have a, a, a sink with a bar of soap to wash their hands in. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Um, to your point about again about the war, just one more thing I thought of is the very ending, the very end, when, yeah, I mean the helicopters come into play here quite a bit, and mm-hmm. that always that makes me think of Vietnam, and then but at the very end when they're trying to get to the road, they're like running for the road and they see the trucks coming, and the last shot of the film is on the truck and it's. Um, like it lands on the star, but before that it says, I think it's, is it the, is it U.S. Army? Like, I don't remember what Something the, like but, and then they just kind of, it, you know, it kind of freezes. And yeah. to me, I was just like, oh, yeah, I mean, he is so on the nose here. I, I didn't realize that he said it wasn't. <laughs> I just always took it for granted that it was. And so I had no idea that he said no. But are you kidding me? <laughs> I don't. I don't know who trying to was trying buddy. to. Bull- yeah, I don't know who yeah. was trying to bullshit. <laughs> it's, it's kind. Of, it's kind of interesting too. It's like, uh, sure, they're saved technically, but there's there's a bit of ambiguity there as well because I mean, what are those two going back to? The, there's there's all this talk of court martial throughout the whole oh, thing. God. There's there's going to be a whole investigation. They're probably in a pretty bad way after this this thing starts getting investigated. You know. Um, Probably not even, probably not much better yeah, there's off. There's going to be a lot of deep shit. <laughs> it's, yeah. um... Although, did you guys um, see there, there, there is a trivia thing that this was changed for, uh, I think, when it screened in Iran, um, where the plot, like, I guess through dubbing or whatever, the, the plot is changed where it's more about uh, these people were. These soldiers were intentionally put there by the U.S. military to be hunted down by manhunters, quote unquote, for some reason, for like their crimes or some shit like that. Like it, it, it's, it was some trivia bit that I didn't write down, but it was like uh, the ambiguous ending is supposed to be, oh, they got caught and they're going to get killed anyway, kind of thing. Oh, um, I, I kind of liked it about like almost like the freeze frame ending is because they're still being pursued by, well, I don't know. But they're still being pursued by anybody because they they got the ones that they're supposed to get. But, but, but like you said, the way they filmed that final scene, 
and I, I will say the attention given to um, I'm looking for the word here, the bloodletting of this film. Yeah, you know, every time like somebody got shot, everything was very like slow motion and like it was very detailed, like the the, the grimace on their face and mm-hmm. their wounds. And I, I gotta say, um, when Peter Coyote gets gets killed, the first first one, the first shot fired, little shot gets fired. Um, the 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 gore on the side of his head. I mean, they show the whole thing. Like he takes yeah. off a part of his head, and the blood comes out. It, 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 it's, it's as gory as the the data entry rod scene in, in RoboCop almost. They don't cut away from it though. <laughs> um. And if you're a uh, animal, per- I doubt they killed a real pig for this movie, but they did. They- I'm, I'm pretty sure they did. Oh, possibly, yeah. yeah. yeah they did. That's pretty. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, they. they it also. Oh, I'm sorry. Was, uh, they. I'm. I'm. They. I'm sure they ate it. You know. Like, yeah. I, mm-hmm. And I mean, I don't mean that in the cannibal Holocaust sense. You know, <laughs> we ate it. It's okay. But what I mean is, I'm sure that's everyday life. Oh yeah. Yeah. They come in, they, they but, do that. Um, I actually don't love the way they slaughtered those pigs. Yeah. I, I kind of... Um, Sm- small warning, guys. Them. I'm sorry. Yeah. They shoot them, and then they go to actually drain it, and they're still alive. And I'm like, okay, you guys kind of suck. But, yeah. <laughs> but um, no, it's pretty... I think it's pretty real, but... Um, ah, shit, now I forgot what I was going to say about it. But anyway, it, um, it used to bother me. When I was a kid, I have found that things, as I'm older, things don't bother me like they used to. Um, used to, like, a scene like that would make me cry. Like, and I just ha- would have to avoid it, you know. It mm. it doesn't it doesn't really affect me th- that badly anymore in my old age, so. You know. But it's, it's kind of hardcore if people have a problem with that. Yeah. But again, that's life. Yeah, I, mean, I know, but people people are sensitive, and I, 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 especially when they, you know, literally bleeding like a stuck pig, when they jam that knife in the pig's, you know, belly just to, to drain the blood, I was like, I'm, I was like ah, you know, I, I wasn't offended, but I kind of felt the pig's pain a little bit, the hog's pain a little bit. And, yeah, yeah, no, it, it, it hurts, and, and then the rabbits, too. Yeah. Right. But it does, it does drive home... Powers Booth's uh, paranoia that oh shit we just ran into a trap but we're, <laughs> everything we're though next, you know? yeah everything in that scene though like it's to, to the, the gunshots to the hogs heads you know and it, it just everything is startled everything startles them until they finally see that those nooses were not for them which you know, I, I I can appreciate so he used every part of the pig when they they, they, they ripped the skin out that, that there's the bacon and then they're, they're gonna have a, a roast for the rest of it and you know it's it, um Living off the land, it, it, it's 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 pretty wild, but it's um. And then they're probably gonna, you know, take the snouts and the ears and the brains and shit and make sauce meat. To do it, right? <laughs> that, that's definitely one one thing that this does better than most um, American movies that directly are set in Vietnam. By the way, like even the ones that are definitely focused on talking about the the war crimes and the atrocities from the American side of things. Um, at least you get some insight into the Cajun culture, and they're presented. At, even if you you don't you don't necessarily have any individuals under than other than Brian James, um, you're at least given a sense of the depth of the culture and what they're like. And you know they're not all out there to kill you and and shit like that, uh, which is definitely a few steps above like how you would generally depict like. Vietnamese in a, in a Vietnam War, so you know. No, that's true, and uh, and yeah, and I, he actually says, you know, these are the good Cajuns. Yeah. Um, but you know, honestly, I don't have an issue with any of these Cajuns. They didn't start it. Right. Okay. These assholes came in, and and he even says, you know, we live back here. Nobody don't fuck with us. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so. And that's the way it is. That is their life. So you come in there, you steal their boats, you shoot at them, even though they're not real. They don't know that. Mm -hmm. Um, What the fuck do you expect? I mean, like, I honestly, I'm like, and then you you kidnap this guy, you blow up his house. I'm like, 
What the beat fuck? him up, try to drown him. Yes. You know? uh, yeah, Brett, I mean, everything they the, the the guardsmen do just compounds every error tenfold. You know, every step of the way, they're just every, compounding their error. Yes. And the trapper says it straight up. He's like, I ain't going to kill you if I don't got to. You know, and he, he tells them how to get out, where to, where to go. Nice like me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> My friends ain't nice like me. <laughs> Are we supposed to say thanks? No. <laughs> ain't supposed to say nothing, soldier boy. <laughs> yeah, when a one-armed man's pointing a rifle at you and giving you, you know, an out, you take it. Oh, okay, spe- take it. <laughs> especially, especially when a one-armed man is implied to have strangled the crazy guy to death and then hung him from the train tracks on a noose. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> I'm like, I'm getting the fuck out of here. <laughs> This ain't the drummer from Death Leopard. This is a real crazy one-armed man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we don't know what he does on the weekends. I mean, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> need, need a Brian James training montage of him working that one arm just to, you know, this is my hanging arm, my own arm, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> kind of doing the military style. This is my rifle. This is my gun. Because <laughs> he... He had to have incredible upper body strength to to, to hang uh, Sheriff Bubba. That's what I'm gonna call him from now on, or Deputy Bubba, <laughs> by his neck on his own, especially hanging that high. Um, but yeah, uh, I I don't have any issue with these guys. It it anybody who knows anything about rural areas, particularly in the South, and well, I say that because that's my home, but well, it used to be, but you don't you don't go fucking around and they don't like strange i have honestly been run out of a lot of towns uh and what i mean by run out is not viciously but when i was in college my friend and i we used to go driving around north georgia all the time we couldn't we couldn't sleep like we'd be up really late and we'd be like ah let's go for a drive and we'd end up like way up in the mountains just and we would drive around we'd find these little towns and it'd be two o'clock in the morning, town is dead. But we would find like a, a marker in town with some interesting facts or something. And we would, you know, hop out and read them. We weren't doing any harm. We weren't there to cause damage or vandalize or bother anyone or anything. We just were driving around. But there are several times when sheriff's car would, you know, come rolling up and we would be like, yeah, let's get out of here. And they would follow us out of town. Mm-hmm. And we would just go. <laughs> and then, you know, we'd go. We're like, okay, well, they don't like that. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> and we knew that. Like, we knew that going in. And there's no way in hell we're ever going to go messing with anybody. Like, it's just when you have these little pockets of areas that have not seen anybody outside of the mountain or outside of the bayou, you just can't just go in there and just, and that's the thing is these guys had such, um, like gall. I hmm? <laughs> said so they had gall. Yes, they did. And they're, I can't actually think of the one word I'm trying to think of, but yeah, it basically, yes. You know, they just kind of go in and do whatever they want. You can't do that. These are people's homes and they don't take kindly to that. And they're fucking armed. And, yeah. uh, they're- well, Brian James, not as much as the other people. But. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but they're you know they're they're very they're very disrespectful and very dismissive of mm-hmm. these people. Is oh, they're just hillbillies. They're just Cajun hillbillies. You know, they're just trash. How many yeah. times, as horror fans, have we seen that happen? Mm-hmm. Uh, when people roll into little towns or they stop at the gas station and they either make fun of people or they disrespect them or they talk about them, but loudly enough to where the other people can hear (laughs) just like, dude, you know, uh, you're asking for trouble. (laughs) Like we know that we know like you do that shit. You're going to die. So, and you just don't go doing that. You're essentially in these people's backyards. Yeah. Yep. You, know, you think it's just the bayou and it's just like, oh, it's just a shanty town, but that's their town. That's their their community and yeah. you're you're invaders. <laughs> you don't you just don't you don't fuck around in people's backyards. I mean, they do have home I mean, that is their home. They do have rules that they follow. They have this their community. You don't just go in and do whatever you want. Now the people that did invite them in, you know, and they gave them drink and offered them food and, and you know, danced and uh, like 
that right there shows that the culture, the Cajun culture is a very, it's actually a lot of fun. You know, they, they mm. know how to have a good time and it's, it's all about community. It's all about, um, fellowship and, you know, spending time together and they're all probably related in some way or another, like way, you know, you go far enough back, but right. they, uh, it's, it's, they're good people, you know, <laughs> they're like, they're just people living their life, you know, and then you got these assholes come in and doing their thing. You know? yeah. So I'm not saying I condone murder sometimes, but <laughs> I, uh, but I get it. You know, yeah. like I get why they they reacted the way they did, and I don't actually have an issue with that because I I know I get it. Like you, these guys were assholes. So, I also think uh, one more thing I thought of as far as Casper's concerned. Did you guys notice how he threw TK Carter up on point uh, after they found the bear traps in the oh, swamp? Yeah, yeah, and yeah totally. It's like, uh, Krebs, you're you need to take you need to take point. And he's like, what? <laughs> like, why me? And uh, I'm like, you fucking coward. <laughs> yeah. Because he had been more than happy to lead the way up to that point. You know, he yeah, went until he saw the traps. He, yeah, he wanted to. And then he, you know, chose him. And there was something about it at the time. And I don't remember. I don't think it was anything that was specifically said or anything like that. But it felt very racist to me, too. Like, I think I felt like something happened at the time that made me think there was that he specifically chose him because he was black, as well as the fact that he didn't want to do it. But oh, I mean, uh, it's a, a, a typical, typical trope of the era uh, or far too many eras, actually, you know, the, the two black uh, guys in, in the squad both uh, end up dying eventually. And one of them has one of the most gruesome deaths. So, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Uh, yeah, the, TK, uh, man, he, oh, the way he goes, I mean, the only person that really gets it worse is, um, oh, what the hell is uh, Stucky when he just slowly goes down in the yeah. sand. And, and what about a quicksand trope? And, you know, like movies and cartoons, whatnot, prepared me for situations of quicksand that I'm never going to encounter in real life. Well, because quicksand's not a real thing. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, though, you're absolutely right. I mean, based on the way I was raised and the stuff I was watching, I really believed that there was going to be quicksand around every corner when I got, mm -hmm. like, when I grow up, I got to watch out for this shit. <laughs> it's going to be everywhere. <laughs> On the Princess Bride, it's like quicksand and giant rats. <laughs> yeah, yeah Kurt. Poor Stucky, though, man. Yeah, Stucky's just chasing the helicopter and, he's, and he fucking starts sinking and he's like, Mondays, right? That that, that was his, his own ceremony of death. You know? He was thinking, get to the chopper. Nope, nope, not going to get to the chopper here. <laughs> now, did Cribs get impaled by something? Is that what happened to Cribs? Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was that trap though, with the spikes. It was, you know. Yeah, that like spring loaded trap. Yeah. Mm. Okay. I, I, I missed that little, that little detail when I was watching this uh, earlier today and. I just was curious if he would, like, did he run into, like, some sharpened, you know, post or something that they left behind? Oh, it was a very gnarly, spiky spring trap. It wasn't really, I mean, it's pretty cool. I like yeah. it. <laughs> but well, it, was, you know, it was a neat effect. Yeah, and they, they must have, and so, like, my only question is, did the Cajuns already have that sitting there? Or did they build it in, you know, very quickly to, to get one of these guys with it? And if they had built it beforehand, who did they build it for? Because I don't think I don't think you'd, you'd be very good for catching like animals necessarily. But uh, no, not unless you're, you know, being chased bound by a bear or something. But yeah. that's not likely to happen there. And they didn't even run into any gators. Mm -mm. Which I thought was interesting. Oh, another thing I learned from this movie. Uh, I've been hearing it basically my whole life. Never realized that Kunas is actually a literal term for Cajuns. Um, I recently watched Gator Bait. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, you know, they refer to her as Kunas 
through the whole damn movie. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, huh. And then when I was watching this, I'm like, he just called him a coon ass. <laughs> like, oh, my God, is that a thing? And so uh, I just thought it was a gator bait thing. I never realized it. And I hadn't even noticed. That it's kind of because it's kind of just kind of in the dialogue here. It's not really – it doesn't stick out, I don't think, as well. But – Anyway, I looked it up, and yeah, it is a specifically a Cajun, like you know, a name for Cajuns, and they often use it for themselves. Uh, I did not know, but I thought that was interesting. Hmm. Hmm. I thought that was just you know, interesting dialogue, you know. But no, right. it's yeah. an actual slur. I guess it's a slur. I don't. <laughs> I can't imagine it would be positive. Yeah, yeah, I can't imagine that. that that's you know, that's a term of endearment. <laughs> and, I, and if and if you and if you say the word coon, even if it's in conjunction with anything else in this day and age, you're definitely going to get some shit. So yeah, that's uh, best not to say any of that. Unless you're like Forrest Gump or something, you know, literal raccoons on Mama's porch. The, 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 <laughs> and I, but I don't. I don't think. I don't think Forrest would say ass though. He'd say, a coon bottom. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, a lot. Lots to talk about. We talked about a lot already. But I'm gonna kick it to Lee first. Uh, anything else you'd like to say about the film um, before we head out? Uh, not really. Other than you know. Total recommendation. This is probably in my top five Walter Hill films um, of the stuff I've seen. It's great. It's got great actors. I mean, one of the big strengths of Walter Hill's stuff is that he seems to get really great casts, and they just they just play off each other, and they do a really good job. And um, this film, you know, it's it feels like. A kind of seventies exploitation film, and and some people might like want to turn their noses up on that and think it's a little lesser because of it, but it's actually fairly deep and it's got a lot going on, and it's definitely worth checking out if you have not done so. If you haven't, I mean, you're just you don't like movies apparently, and you should fix that problem in your life. Cameron, uh, I agree with Lee. If you haven't seen this movie, you need to check it out. It's underappreciated, underseen. Most people I talk to about it have not seen it, and I chastise them every time. And it, again, an impressive cast, probably one of the best ensemble casts that Hill put together. I liken this a lot to Extreme Prejudice you know, that he did. It's got a lot of great people, including Powers Booth, you know, and this is, uh, I'm a huge Powers Booth fan and Fred Ward fan, so I love this movie. But, you know, uh, it, this is the movie that made me like Alan Autry because I, I, when I had seen it, I didn't really like the man that much. But, like, I was like, okay, this guy's all right. He's, he's pretty good. And, you know, even some of the bit players like Brian James, Sonny Landon, Alan Graff, they just add to everything. And it's uh, it's a great little movie. I, I mean, it's I liken it to being like a slasher film. Mm. I think it's a lot like, you know, they're being stalked and picked off one by one. You know, oh. it's a... Uh, it's an you know it's an action horror drama. It's it's it's, it's so well rounded, and it's 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 a gem in the rough. I mean, it's, if you haven't seen it, gosh, people are listening. I implore you, ch check it out, please, please. Jamie. Well, these guys pretty much I think summed it up really well. You need to watch it if you haven't seen it. See it. It's definitely worth your time. Um, one thing that Cameron stated is, is it's even more true with one scene that we didn't mention, but um, it being kind of like a slasher film, to where after the, their compatriots have have had met their demise in the swamp, oh, they yeah. bury them, but then the Cajuns dig them up and and po like post them as trophies to, for them to find, mm -hmm. you know, um. Oh, that's what I'm. Um, thank you. I meant that's one thing I meant to to bring up is because up to that point you could kind of write off. Well, those traps might not be for us. Well, those rabbits might not represent us. Well, that you know, and I think when you get to the point where they've actually dug up your dead guys and tied them to a pole so that you would make sure to see them, <laughs> you can kind of figure that it's about you. Yeah, it's a very Jason Voorhees thing to do. Mm-hmm. 
Jason Voorhees, Michael Myers Michael as well. Myers, yeah. His art projects as, as <laughs> Blumhouse, or Blum, Blumhouse, Blum, Jason Blum cult refers to them. I thought you were going to say Blumkin and for first there. I was going to say like, <laughs> 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 That's a whole different show. Judge. I don't judge. We don't kink shame here. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> No, but great time. You know, I, 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 this is probably one I watched less, and that's not that's not really a slight to the film. It's just one that have I have less access to. But if you like access to this film, I think there's like a pretty unceremonious DVD out here in the states and a much better Scream Factory Blu-ray that you guys could own of this mm-hmm. particular movie. Um, good, good times, good, good, good locations. I mean, the location. I, I say this all too often in film, but the location, them being in the swamp, in the in literally, as they say in, in the Nam, in the shit, yeah, <laughs> um, really adds some character, and it, it is a character in this movie, the, the swamp, and them literally as 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 actors and characters, you know, enduring flu-like conditions to, to, to act their asses off in this movie, it. it Ninety percent of all churns, you know, everything's gonna have a weakness, but I think this does have a lot of weaknesses because you got you got to say the conditions play play a role in the film, and I love it. I love it for that reason, and everything else, and the great character actors in the film. Um, we don't rate these, so I I'd say we all recommend it and uh, check it out. Southern Comfort. Not to knit a wall. It's also available on Tubi if people want to watch it. Oh, in the... nice. Mm. Nice. I, I found can... better prints on Tubi than in, in movies I actually own. So there's a... you, can also, uh, you can also download a really good print of it off of Rear Lust. Uh, when, I, when I first did this uh, for my podcast uh, in 2020, I downloaded it from Rear Lust and then like uploaded it uh, in private to my YouTube uh, channel for so for my uh, uh, podcast mates, uh, my co-hosts, and still there. That's that's how I rewatched it for this podcast. So sneaky, sneaky, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, that's the end of this one. Um, let's all pimp our stuff now. Cameron, you first, brother. Go for it. Well, you can find me at Cinema Degeneration. I have a whole slew of podcasts under that banner uh, we do some full moon movies some grindhouse exploitation flicks and we're getting ready to launch this month uh, here in a couple of days an entire month long vincent price appreciation month we're doing nothing but mm-hmm. vincent price movies for a whole month but you can find us on podbean spotify stitcher you name it we're there uh, lee uh, if you want to find more of my stuff, my podcast name is They Must Be Destroyed on Site. You can go to tmbdos.podbean.com and find all my stuff there. Um, as of this recording, uh, by the time you hear this put out, I will. my two latest episodes will be uh, our basically our year-end best of you know first-time watches for 2021 that I'll be recording later tonight, actually. And... Uh, I've just put out an episode of my Blood on the Track show. Last episode of uh, 2021 for for that uh, show, where I did a supersized episode covering fictional bands and music artists in movies. So a bunch of uh, soundtrack and score selections uh, from movies that feature that. So there you go. Well, that's a fun idea. It was. Uh, it was uh, not as fun doing all the research, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I bet not. Also, um, I don't think it's I don't think you're supposed to say the name of your show without saying it, you know, dramatically. Like <laughs> Yell, yelling it, yeah. Yes. They must be destroyed on site. <laughs> <laughs> Because I hear that like eight times when, uh, whenever I listen to a Duncan episode. Yeah. <laughs> I, I feel like I need to record an, a new, no, new no, promo no, every week no, just I get to give the Duncan. With it. I like it. It's <laughs> like when, um, it's like the, uh, oh, hello, this is the Doom Show. You know? Yeah. Um, 
I I hear it over. I get excited about it when I hear it over and over again. <laughs> I'm like, you know, oh, cheese. They're talking about cheese <laughs> at the end of the promo. <laughs> and then I, I went to, uh, one time I was at the grocery store and they had, <laughs> I took a picture of the Colby Jack cheese and I sent it to them. And I'm like, look <laughs> what I see. And, and yeah. Anyway, my point is, don't change it. We like it. All right. I won't. And Colby Jack is delicious, you know. Colby, Colby Jack. M- m- much like Jamie, you're delicious too, girl. But uh, tell us about your shows, girl, once again. Uh, well, there is Horror in the House of Salmons that I do with Brian, and that is available on Anchor, which pretty much means it's available everywhere that you can listen to podcasts. And then the What You're Watching show that I do with Bo monthly is on Legion. And then I just do various spots here and there where I visit my friends. Well, you are always welcome. Anything I produce, Jamie, you know this. So just say, hey, I, I want to do that. Or, you know, it, 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 uh, but Jamie's not on the socials anymore. So I have to text her and say, hey, you, you want to do this? Which is how this guest spot came along. I'm like, hey, I will do that. And I say, hey, that's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I got to tell you, I love it. I love not being on Facebook. I love not being on Twitter. I am so happy. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just happy. And I was like, oh man, this is going to suck. It's going to be hard. Like it really wasn't. I honestly, uh, I have to go back there now when I go to post the show or whatever. Um, and it pains me to do it. <laughs> I don't want to, but you know. so but, you know, not a bad idea. If anybody's considering it, Jump on that bandwagon. It's it's nice. I, I may text you later with a, another, you know, if you want to show up thing. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. I'm. Hey, you know, you can always reach me. You know, and I I still have Messenger, so you people can get in touch with me. It's just that, you know, you don't have to see me blathering all the time about uh-huh. bullshit you don't care about, or nor do I. Then you get to listen to Jamie and Iris flirt with each other on the show, and that's always a good time. You know. <laughs> <laughs> I love my flower. I know you love your flower. I love your flower too. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Beautiful lady. Um, yeah, all the shows I do and I I just started this, you can get on the same RSS feed as all the other shows, but I put a label on it because people tend to do that. I, I call it the, the butcher shop now. All the shows that I do, um I produce with with the, these gentlemen and this lady and whoever else I do them with. Um, we'll be under that banner on, if you look on Facebook, on, on the group page, that is what it's called now, The Butcher Shop. But you can download the episodes for the same RSS feed as Cinebeef Podcast. It's all, it's all there. And on Legion, respectively. But, uh, those shows include this one, of course. Cinebeef Podcast, Burning for Springwood, we just released an episode. Uh, I'm gonna close out the first season of that. Um, Cinebeef record on Tuesday. It did that uh, 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 another uh, it'd be our, our holiday hangover episode and um bless the BD clinic they they beat us to the punch did female trouble first we're gonna do female trouble again uh with a face in the crowd and that's gonna be your holiday hangover episode um uh blood from the core can be found on legion patreon as well as the bonus episodes for for this um Two Dream Rhythm commentaries coming back in January with at least two new episodes, if I had to guess. Right, that's that's the, that's what I'm going to promise, two new episodes. Because uh, it's, it's, I could I think I can get up a crew for two episodes in January. And uh, I feel like I'm forgetting one. And uh, that's how my brain works, I guess. But, um... <laughs> um yeah, thanks for listening. The, the, the next show you should hear on the regular feed... Is the next film in the, the Walter Hill Pantheon, which is from 1982, and that's um screen debut, uh, ma- major film debut of one Eddie Murphy teaming up with Nick Nolte in uh, 48 Hours. Um, again, Brian James is back for that again, and uh, Michael Beck is back again for that again, and so is Sonny Landham, so get ready for that shirtless Sonny Landham that we all know and love and uh <laughs> yeah but the next uh Patreon show you should do which should be released right around the time this is released would be uh 
Cameron's choice of deliverance and um to, to go with this film i uh, I'm real proud of my my next patreon choice for for forty eight hours because uh it's my choice and I want to say hey what goes with p pulling that convict to, to go find a convict thing and I say let's do something stupid to watch demolition man and talk about it oh, because yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm all about demolition man. <laughs> I don't believe in the term guilty pleasure because I love that movie unabashedly. Oh, yeah. It's, it's really you know what? good for you. I don't believe in that term either. Like, I don't yeah. think you should ever feel guilty about something that gives you pleasure. I mean, unless it, you know, hurts unless other people. Yeah. Involves skinning someone. But, you know, <laughs> if, it's a, if it's watching a film, then don't feel guilty about it. Enjoy it. Be proud. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So that this has been last call of torches. We hope you enjoyed yourself and um come back next time for uh forty eight hours and as the Beverly Hillbillies theme song would say, uh sit a spell. You know, take your shoes off. Y'all come back now. You hear? Yeah, and if you're gonna be penetrated, make sure it's a small military unit that's doing it, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> it's penetration. <laughs> bye bye y'all. You should tell that to Ned Beatty. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>